Okay, so um, my presentation will be focusing on one text, one Tango text, the Tang 231, and uh, explore its connection with Tibetan Buddhism in general, and also uh, the development of Buddhist epistemology in Tibet uh, in particular. So uh, here's my presentation outline. Uh, I'll first do a very brief uh, introduction of um, who I am um, as a scholar and how I got to this subject, uh, which is further a part of my uh, larger dissertation project, uh, that's an introduction. And also um, then um, we'll focus on the text itself. Um, I'll discuss the title, the author of the text, the structure of the text, We'll dig further into the text and examine some uh, important features of the text as well, of the content. Uh, that's the text. And then uh, we'll put the text in the trends of Tibetan, um, uh, of the developments of Tibetan Buddhism in the 11th and 12th centuries and see its significance um, in that connection. And then we have to conclude. So that's basically uh, the outline, um, the contents I'm going to present today. So let's get started. Introduction. I know it's two trends in Buddhist studies. So um, I saw two trends in Buddhist studies in the last decade or so. One is the advancement in making sense of Tango Buddhist texts. So we have um, um, now um, uh, deciphered the language and also we uh, try to read Tango Buddhist texts and we try to compare them with their Chinese originals or Tibetan originals. Uh, for the Chinese part, we have almost done the work. Uh, for the Tibetan side, uh, we have mainly uh, deciphered those texts that um, that can, came from a tantric origin, a rather tantric origin. Um, that's the trend one. And trend two, uh, this is for Tibetologists um, and those who are interested in, in Tibetan studies. Um, so the advancement in understanding the pre-Sakya Buddhist ep epistemological tradition in Tibet. And this is also important. So in the last decade, uh, scholars have tried to understand some manuscripts um, that, that can represent an early uh, Gadamba epist uh, Buddhist epistemological tradition in Tibet. Um, so Buddhist epistemological tradition uh, in Sanskrit, Pramana, in Tibetan, Tsema. Um, it talks about, it, dis it discusses the, um, what kind of episodes of awareness are valid. And if it's valid, um, uh, how does it work? So this is a very brief introduction of these two trends. Um, but then these two trends, well, there's a connection between these two trends. We'll get you there. Um, but for each trend, there is a limit. For trend one, the limit is that um, there's some texts belong to Tibetan scholastic traditions are difficult to understand. Um, so this text includes, of course, the Uma text, the Manayamaka text, and also um, some Prajna Paramita text, and also um, the Pramana text I'm going to talk about. Um, this uh, exoteric text, if we may call them, are not that hard to understand in terms of the content, you know, not compared to um, um, esoteric texts, but they're really hard in terms of language because in the scholastic tradition, especially in Tibet, in Tibet, you have very long sentences. You have uh, their um, special principles in writing texts. And then when you read them, it's really hard, especially when they're presented not in Tibetan, but in Tango translations. So that's the limit of the trend one. And the limit for the second trend is that we lack sources. So, um, of course, we had already um, manuscript, many manuscripts from 15th century, 14th century, from central Tibet, 
that can uh, provide some information. And some of the manuscripts are really important, but we still lack sources in general. So what is the connection between these two trends then? As I see, the limit of the first trend can be partly fixed by the advantages of trend two, because um, they're from the same period and same tradition. So if you understand the Tibetan tradition, then it helps you understand the Tango tradition. So that's the first connection. Then the limit of trend two can also be partly fixed by the advantages of trend one, because in Tango collections, it preserves um, Tango translations of Tibetan text whose Tibetan originals are not yet available. So by combining these two trends and their advantages, let's form a coherent organism. And that is my dissertation project to study Tibetan Buddhist epistemological tradition in the Tango state. Okay, so let's continue. Let me talk about this. Um, the identity of Tang 235. Remember, uh, this presentation is about Tang, uh, the, Tang, the manuscript Tang 231. But why am I talking about Tang 235 now? Because it's connected, it's the start point. So the Tang 235 has this title. If we translate it, it means value reasoning, something like that, dispelling the obstruction of mind. Now, interestingly, there is a text written by this guy, Chaba Chigisenge, who was the sixth abbot of the Sampo Monastery in central Tibet. He wrote this text. His major work in Buddhist epistemology, Tema Igmuse. Yeah. And if we translate Tema Igmuse into English, then it becomes epistemology, the scholar of the darkness in mind. So these two titles seem to match. And scholars had suspected that the Tangut might be just a translation of the Tibetan text. But previously, scholars did not um, try to engage in a textual study of, of both. But last year, um, having engaged in that textual, meticula, uh, textual study meticulously, um, I, tried, um, I successfully identified the uh, Tangu text with the Tibetan original. So now we're sure. Yes, they're identical. The Tangu text was a translation of the Tibetan text. And this is important because this then becomes the start point of our search. Why? Now let's do this. The left side is the chronology of the Sampu tradition of, of Buddhist epistemology. It starts with Ngolotawa, Loden Shira, you know, the, the second abbot of the Sampu Monastery, who actually initiated the whole uh, scholastic tradition of Buddhist epistemology in Tibet uh, in the uh, Chira period. And then we have this guy, Chava Chegisenge, uh, who was the sixth abbot and also a central figure. And we have Chava's students, Tsangaba Zindu Senge, and other people. Now, this is the chronology of the Sampu tradition of Buddhist epistemology. And on the right side, we have this, of the Tangwood Buddhist epistemological text. What do you have? We have Tang 230, we have Tang 231, which I'll be talking about soon. Um, and we have Tang 235, and we have Tang 236, where many of them on Buddhist epistemology. Now we know that Tang 235 is a translation of Chava's work. So we established this connection. And also we have other connections. In Tang 230 and Tang 231, they both quote, they both refer to Ngolotawa. They mention Ngolotawa in the text. So they're loosely connected. Now, if we have these three connections at least, then I'll give a hypothesis I hope we don't have too, too many hypotheses today, but I, I have my own hypothesis on this, uh, which is, I think probably all Tangut Buddhist epistemological texts have this sample origin. Yeah. 
So if that is the case, then Tang to 30 will have a sample write or author. Tang to 31 also has a sample author. Tang to 36 also has a sample author, but these authors are you know, uh, too late, unidentified. So our work, um, if we want to substantiate this hypothesis, we want to prove it, then we have to study text one by one, this text one by one, and check if they really um, belong to the sample tradition. So that's why um, I'm, I'm uh, studying this text now. So the text of Tang 231, we want to see now if it belongs to the sample tradition. Now let's first take a look at its title and author. Title is this, um, Entangled. And if we translate it, it's clarifying the meaning of phrases of the Nyayarindu, or clarifying the meaning of words. Um, the Tibetan reconstruction can be Rikpe Tibe Tsidun Sewa. The author is this guy, who is Central Tibetan Greek master, monk, wisdom conqueror. So here, wisdom and conqueror. You now these two characters form the name wisdom conquer. Normally we see this 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 conquer this um, character, which is shi uh, shi li the shi in Chinese, uh, go together with with sheng. So sheng shi means um, the victorious one, which which is the Buddha. But here it's a little weird because uh, it's just hui and shi. So wisdom conquer. So we can probably reconstruct the name as xiaobie. Or or something like that. So that's the title and author and the structure. There's first opening verse. The author says, um, I, I pay homage to the all knowing one. I will explain a little bit the meaning of the words. Something like that. That's the first part. Second part, a discussion of the seven treatises of Dharma purity. And this is interesting because. Um, in Chinese, in Chinese, uh, in Ming, in Chinese, um, Hitu Vidya tradition, um, we don't often see the discussion of the seven treatises of Dharma Kirti. This is quite a Tibetan thing uh, to, to um, arrange the, um, the seven treatises of Dharma Kirti in two parts the three major one and the four branch one. And the third part is uh, an explanation of key concept. This is a body part. Uh, the explanation of key concepts in Buddhist epistemology based on the three uh, chapter divisions of the Nyaya Bindu. The first one is um, the um, the Xian Qian, the uh, Pratyaksha uh, in Tibetan is Meng Yuan The second one is Zi Li Sui Liang, Sanskrit uh, Swarata Namana, Tibetan Zhang Dun Jepap. And third one is Tali Sui Liang, Sanskrit Param para arta anumana, Tibetan, shendun So this is the basic structure. Um, but um, here, uh, if, if we just have a, a um, general impression of the structure, uh, it may seem to have some connection with the Tibetan sample tradition, but uh, we don't know for sure. So we have to go deeper. Now, this is the section I love the best. So, we're going deeper in the text and try to find clues and see if these clues can prove whether this text uh, belong to uh, the sample tradition. Um, my, my perspective is, uh, my start point is to, to find those references because this author in this text refers to many masters uh, in Tibetan history. And let's see if these masters have connections with the sample tradition. Now we first have this guy, this uh, Ngo, and this character means master, okay? So master Ngo. And we also have master Hyo, and we have master R. And we have this guy. Uh, this person, this figure, his name is not um, phonetically transcribed. Uh, his Tibetan religious name is translated. So the three ca characters mean uh, Fa Shang Shi, so Dharma High Master Fa Shang Shi. 
So can we make any connections here? Of course. So the first one is easy. So Maelstrom law should be low Tower, low than zero. There's no problem. The second one, this Kyop, um, well, the only person I can think of in, in, in the uh, entire Tibetan intellectual history who is good at Tibetan, uh, who is good at Buddhist epistemology is this guy, Kyunrin Chinja, who was a student of Wallace Hall. And then by the same token, we identify this master R with R, Chang Piu Ye Xie, uh, flourished in mid 12th century, also a sample, uh, sample master. And this guy, this Fa Shang Shi, this Dharma High Master, we identify him with Xiang Cebong, Chegi Lama, who flourished also early 12th century, was a student, a uh, direct disciple of Ngolo Tawa. And we have a further clue. In one place in the text, it says that Master R does not agree with Master Kyung at one point, because Master Kyung proposes a, a, a fourfold typology and Master R proposes only a, a threefold type, typology. So Master R disagrees with Master Kuhn uh, in that point, on that point. So if that is true, then it matches perfectly the relative chronology here because R Chang Chu Ye Xie was later than Kyung. Now on this point, on this stage, I think we can be uh, relatively safe to conclude that this text is indeed a Sangpu text composed by a Sangpu author. Now, what does this mean? What is the significance of this finding? Let's then put this text back in the Tibetan intellectual history. I'm doing a comparison here. This is the Tang 231, we have seen the company. And then this text, this Tsema Dekona Niduba, uh, is also a very important text in, in Sangpu tradition. Um, uh, they're similar in many places. In many places, we'll see, they're similar. Um, at the very first of, at the very beginning of this text, the Tang uh, 231, and also at the very beginning of the Tedu, they share the exactly same passage that discusses the seven treatises of Dharma. Uh, also word by word translation. So Tang 231 um, seems to be a word by word translation of Tema de That's the similarities here, but there are also differences. For example, we know, yeah, author, of course, different. Western Conquer cannot be this guy. It's not Jeba uh, Shenu Chanchu, who is the author of the city. And then also the basic text that this two texts base themselves on. The Tang 231 bases itself on the Nyayavindu, which is shorter. The Tema Dekona Nidiba bases itself on Pramana Vinishcha, which is longer and more uh, philosophically sophisticated. And talking about references, we know the uh, that the Tema Dekona Nidiba calls this person. And the Tang Chu Suriwan calls this person. Now, um, some of them are identical, but Notice here, Chaba Chegi Senge is quoted 99 times in Tema Dekona Nyujiba, but this person is completely not seen in Tang 231. So what does that mean? That means the author of Tang 231 is either um, a person who lived before Chaba's time or his contemporary, because if he was Chaba's contemporary, then when Chaba wrote his important work, Tema Igimunse, the work uh, was not yet an influential one. Um, so that can make sense. So uh, that's the significance because if Tang 231 was actually composed earlier than Tema Dekona Nijiba, then it represents a trend or a development before uh, the Chab Chaba's time. So it represents a pre-Chaba uh, Sangpu uh, philosophy system, uh, philosophical system on Buddhist epistemology. So let's reach to the conclusion. The first conclusion, the first point is 
The, con the content of Town 231 substantiate as one proof, the hypothesis that um, uh, the epistemological transition flourishing in Town 231 um, might have a um, sample origin. That's the first point. Then the second point is the Town 231 was likely composed by a contemporary of Chaba because um, it's, it's unlikely that he was earlier than Chaba and could also quote from those masters. So I think he could be, he might be likely to be a contemporary of Chaba. Uh, and this text then shows features of pre Chaba epistemology in the Sanku tradition, which is important because we lack sources uh, as such. And finally, then the town 231 discovered with many manuscripts in Harapoto, who we really use as a primer in Buddhist epistemology. While the Munse, the town 235, discovered with only one manuscript, was probably reserved for students with higher intellect. That's all, thank you. All right, thank you very much, Zhou Yang, for your very fascinating presentation.